thank everyone for your patience today. Uh, and I also want to give a big thank you to Melinda McCrary and to Evelyn Santos, who just met. Um, they're from the Museum of the City of Richmond. And uh, another special thanks to Karen Buchanan, who is uh, the uh, history tour guide here in Richmond and made the initial introductions. Also, I want to thank all of you for coming today. I hope that you've had a chance to see the exhibit here and to see what a wonderful job they've done in this space. Uh, and my name is Peter Cunningham, and in addition to researching in literature and history in the 20th century, I've traveled the world for about 30 years uh, working in industry and lived in, on the equator for 25 of those years and in uh, many different countries where I've had the opportunity to study different cultures, immersing myself in local mores, folkways, and practices. And one thing I noticed in those travels was that there was a lot of development that was going on that echoed or reflected developments that were seen in the U.S. post-World War I. And I started talking about that with some of my old academic advisors, and they just suggested that I keep track of what I'm seeing, keep my notes, and then go back and do some research into what was happening in the U.S. at that time, and how these things could be related. So I started on that path, and then I found that there was a lot of things that uh, uh, were happening in the U.S. that, that uh, w were happening nationwide, but they had a, a very important effect on local communities. And that is what brought me to the museum today, is looking at how some of the developments in Richmond can be seen in the greater trend of things that occurred in the U.S. So today I want to share some of these findings. And uh, when we start, there's going to be some terms that I'll use that I want to explain <coughs> first. The, um, you'll hear a term called end of empire, which is a uh, term that's used to describe the effect of World War I with the fall of the empires in Europe, the Austro-Hungarian, the Russian, um, the start of the fall of the British Empire, French, German, all of those were undone. There's also a term that's used uh, that's called um, the masculinity of empire and the masculinity of survival, which are sociological terms that were used to describe the um, rigid structure under which people lived during the reign of empires and the necessary survival and uh, creativity that was needed after the fall of the empires. And another term will be juvenoia, and that is um, a sociological term that defines an older generation's disdain for a younger generation and the fear that the younger generation is going to cause ruin to all of the things built up by the older generation. These things all come into play as we look at the evolution of trends and uh, across the U.S. and in Richmond, um, and uh, we cross over from uh, arts and and um, uh, social trends to industry and governmental trends. So what we see here is, uh, you know, just it's a little whimsical. Um, and uh, during the time of the construction of a lot of the skyscrapers and things, there were things that were done that were just done to uh, have a bit of fun, but they were looked on as being, you know, a little bit crazy. So I thought I'd start with something that seemed a little bit crazy. And the next slide, please. So what happened here is that we had, a, we had a group that was called a lost generation. Importantly, that term was phrased, was originated by a French mechanic who was commenting on the bad work habits of one of his employees. He said it to Gertrude Stein, who in turn communicated that in one of her salons, and it was picked up by a gentleman named Malcolm Cowley, who was a prominent literary critic and publisher in the U.S., and it became a label used for that generation. On reflection, though, we see that that post-World War I generation was actually called the moderns, and much of the world that we live in today was created at that time, and there's been a lot of refinements since then. But the mix of things that happened at that time need to be reviewed. So we had the end of all of the empires and the end of the rigid social and class structures of the empires. And we had the evolution of all of these trends 
that uh, began in the U.S. Now, the, the, the other relation that we need to know is that this uh, term uh, masculinity of empire, masculinity of survival, in the U.S. it was actually the masculinity of empire was the American Protestant dream. That can be traced all the way back to the Puritans. So there was a uh, fear that the, found, the, the fundamental structures and uh, principles by which people should lead their lives was lost when the modern started to reinvent America and the world. We see that as this went forward over time, m the media, sociologists, all tried to come up with labels for behavior during those periods. So you had the, the moderns, which were called the lost generation, but uh, that's not true. We had the Dis Depression era people, we had the World War II generation, the lucky few born between World War II and the Korean War, the Beats and the Baby Boomers up through the 60s. And during that period of time, we had all of these things going on. And the one guiding principle was this masculinity of survival. And uh, we can look at a, a couple of other characteristics for this, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the masculinity of survival. But just to get to the notes, the World War I uh, was transformed by the utter ambivalence of World War I. There was a tremendous loss of life in Lucre on one hand. Sixty million people di died in Europe during World War I as a result of combat and the epidemic of flu that followed. It's coincidental with this end of empire. There just wasn't a, an ability to maintain the structures and operation of the empires. and. In the war, you had a, uh, the officer class, which were royal appointments, that were killed at a rate of three or four times higher than the enlisted men. So there was a huge void created. In Europe, they were just trying to recover from the war. In America, they were able to take advantage of that void and to create a new world here to tr and to export it around the world. And that's... Uh, completely new for America. America had been isolationist. That's why there was a lot of uh, reaction to what was going on and why an older generation said that those people were actually lost. They had lost their path. They didn't know what they were doing. Why are they building these things? Why do we have to travel cross country? Why do we need airlines? Why do we need to have women's movements and suffrage and things like that? So there was a broken mold with, with the end of the empire and uh, the fall of the masculinity of empire and, it's, and it is worldwide and the U.S. was able to get a hold of it and, and to, to, to master it. Because under the empire there are 1.35 billion people or three quarters of the world population living under the governance of these few empires. That, the end of the empire is freed up a lot of creativity and a lot of opportunity for people to do things. The resources to do them were here in America. So, as I mentioned, there's, there's a, a, an emotional reaction also to this, in that looking at this Protestant American dream, there was a uh, conclusion from this generation that it was filled with perfidy, judgment, self-righteousness, encased in romantic images borrowed from empires, and it's messy, confused individualism and legalism, and a lack of discipline, a lack of ritual, legal and spiritual dryness. All of that were the descriptors that the younger people used in looking at the prior generations. So you had the juvenoia, which is a term that people use, and you might just call it a youthful disdain for the past. The next slide, please. <clears throat> and this just shows the effect of war. So in the, in the war, you had you, your normal population distribution is going to look like the blue pyramid on the left. In the war, you had a loss of the population primarily in the ages from 18 to 40. And that loss of life there is the void that was left, and the inability to deal with it created the opportunities for Americans. And as I mentioned, American casualties were 900,000 or 1.7 percent of the total casualties during the war. Young Americans from the farm, the field, the mill were the survivors. And the Protestant American dream had kept them on the farm, had kept them in the field, and had kept them in the mills. Uh, 
as that was viewed as being not relevant to the new opportunities, those constraints were lifted and you had the, the invention of the new world. So that was called the masculinity of survival. I'll bring up one reference to um, the, the person that everybody still follows today as being representative of that. That's Ernest Hemingway. He saw this trend occurring, and he understood the Protestant American dream and the masculinity of empire. He was raised in a Congregationalist community in Oak Park, Illinois, and uh, then he went to war at 18. Didn't spend a lot of time at war. He was wounded within a few weeks of arriving at the front. But he had studied under uh, Louis Agassiz and St. Beauvoir's methods, which um, cause you to take a very close look at your world around you and physical and uh, uh, the behavioral aspects of it. And he was able to identify the changes and he made his stream of consciousness the stream of consciousness for the generation. So if you read Hemingway, you can actually see the, the followings that he had where people would say, oh, what would Hemingway do? And then they would try to, try to emulate that. Now that put him in an odd position, but uh, he relished it and his career thrived. And one of the points that came up in it was making your own way. So with the loss of the rigidity of the empire, people had to make their own way to create and discover new things and to make a place for themselves in the world. And they did it through lifestyle invention and lifestyle reinvention repeatedly. The, the literary references to these things would include Malcolm Cowley's observations that the survivors fill the void created by the fallen royals and royal appointed military officers who are the educated, the tallest, the most robust, the most enterprising, the most adventurous, the idealists, the bravest, and the most forthright um, in Europe. The survivors find that uh, the culture, mores, folkways, taboos, society, vocabulary, and panache that one time were demonstrated by these officers, and they just moved into those roles. Can we get the next slide, please? And this one, can, and can you hit the button for, um, so that this, this will show the movie part of it in there? Um, it's called Slideshow. Well, okay, but there's an embedded movie in here that shows these different things. So between 1920 and 1950, if we look at patent issuances, uh, in that 30 year period there were more patents, four times more patents issued than in the 130 years preceding it. That's the invention of the world that we live in today. And what it also means is that you have people that have to create the changes and then they have to live with the changes and create roles for themselves in this new world. So that's a huge burden and, and as a result you then would see sociological changes that we'll talk about in a minute. But you had things such as skyscrapers, automobile industry, consumer credits, airline and mass travel and airports, recording, sound, movies, television, mass advertising. None of these were available until they were invented after World War I. Can, next slide. Uh, in, the, in the National Highway Network, electric lights in homes, cathode ray tube, which became the television, uh, electrification and power plants, telephones, indoor plumbing in homes, these became available to everybody after World War I. They weren't available before. And then if we want to look at this, some of these points of social change, the movie isn't showing, but uh, we also had these, these uh, developments of mass migration of people within America and worldwide. Mass migration of people to the cities from the rural areas. Remember that the rigid structures from the Protestant American dream kept people in the farms, in the fields, and in the mills. That was gone. There was a huge expansion of cities and infrastructures. There was a women's suffrage movement, mass communication, one voice, a hundred million listeners. That um, uh, was, next slide. 
And then you had these, these things of living in the moment, where people thought at, at a certain point that they were becoming overwhelmed with all of the change. They had to live in the moment. They had to focus on what needed to be done at that point in time. And uh, the women's suffrages, immigration law reform started then, sexual liberation, Freud's links, Freud linked sex and death, which was his book Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And you had things like the Harlem Renaissance, which was an inner city re re uh, renaissance in New York. But that spread to all major cities across the country. Um, in Richmond, one of the things that I wanted to look at is that you had, from the industry side, you had the development of the auto industry here with Ford Motor, petroleum industry with Standard Oil, and the railroads. They were the three biggest employers. They were also part of the three largest industries to develop nationwide at that time. In addition, Richmond had a, a woman mayor, I mean one of the first cities to have a woman mayor, and there was a um, women's rights movement and a women's vote movement that was very, very strong here. So Richmond was amongst the progressive cities in the country that were moving forward with all of these things at a fast pace. And the other, the other points to consider when you have those industries develop, you have the trade unions and you start to have this issue of class divide. Then you had the issues of the banking failures. Going on in time, you had the war, the Cold War, the Atlantic Alliance, and the end of American isolation. All of those are things that we're living with now. If you pick up the newspaper or you read Donald Trump's tweets, they're all dealing with some aspect of these programs, institutions, inventions and industries that developed or became prevalent at that time. And can we go to the next one? So I also wanted to just show something quickly. If you were to look at social media, because it's been around forever, social media is defined as media and the ability of one person to communicate with another. That's Mark Zuckerberg's definition of it. These were the ways that people communicated back then. As I mentioned, one voice, 100 million readers. You had the, a lot of the same magazines, the same television networks, radio networks. Uh, cinemas were huge. 65% of the population would go to cinemas where they had newsreels uh, on a weekly basis. That's, you know, and that's just um, um, a, a, a random number. That's every week, 65% of the population would be in the cinema and getting the newsreel. So now you have a lot of these same banners, but you get access to them today using Facebook, Twitter, Google, Pinterest. And uh, so it's just a different way of getting the things that were invented back then. It's still the same objective, one voice, 100 million audience. Just a different way to do it. If we look at our generation now, or our times now, and uh, we can reference this back to the, to the original uh, slide like this. Um, we see that the Generation X has to deal with a, a, a situation similar the, to what was dealt with at the end of World War I. Now you have the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Soviet bloc, the rise of the Middle East bloc, China's isolation ended, and the threat of global annihilation through nuclear war has been diminished. So what we see still in effect is that the, 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 the decline of the masculinity of fear that had arisen, but the continuation of the masculinity of survival. So people are behaving in the same ways now that they did back then. They're dealing with a lot of the same issues now that they had to deal with then. Sociologists and the media are still applying labels to people. Uh, so you see that the Generation X, those who came of age at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, are called the new lost generation. That's a reflection of a recognition that these people have to deal with this new situation of uncertainty, inventing a new world, creating a new lifestyle for themselves. And you see a lot of that echoed in how people want to describe themselves. There's still the, the uh, overriding objective of having individualism, individualization within a large population. And we're still seeing the decline of the American Protestant dream. It does make um, a push to resurface from time to time. 
and we can because as I said we can trace it all the way back to the Puritan uh, arrival in this country um, through that development of the Protestant American dream and then today it's manifested in the Tea Party so you have all of those same governing principles that are still forces today and you have this ongoing uh, generational uh, division between those that want to create something new and those that are comfortable with the past. So the juvenile continues today. But yeah, so the Generation X, the people that are really kind of in control of things now, uh, are then followed by Generation Y, the Echo Boomers, um, and the, what they're calling now the Generation Google. So these things are still going on and they're trends that we're going to see continuing for the next uh, round of, uh, of development. And one of the points that needs to be kept in mind is that these, and, and to, so that we don't get carried away by what we see and hear in the media, is that there are these underlying evolutionary and developmental trends that we can rely on. Because they're there, they're not reported on as uh, major news the way that you know the immediate daily um, announcements are reported on so we can we can just rely that uh, these things are going to continue and we can have a uh, an expectation for them and we don't have to look at it as being something that's negative we can see the progress and we can appreciate it and we can rely on some of the younger generation to get us through it Yes. So where does the millennials fit into this generation label? The, these echo boomers. Echo boomers and Generation Y, yeah. Yeah, and the millennials are really a subset within this. They have a loud voice, but as of yet they don't, they haven't changed anything. They're just uh, actually um, using a lot of the changes that were provided for them. We see a lot of a lot of uh, refinements now but uh, from the millennials we're not seeing major changes and if we look the, 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 the reason the social media slide was there is we can look at it and say that this is still the same objective for people to be able to communicate and exchange information this is just a different way of doing it so in a certain respect you look a little bit more trendy if you have your iPhone and you know, your thumbs are moving rapidly but um, it's not necessarily any different than people would do when they were sitting on the subway train with their newspapers covering their faces. Um, and in fact, you'll find that the readership for newspapers and magazines penetration was higher than, than it is for the internet and, and uh, uh, mobile devices today. Only, uh, it was a 200, in 1940, it was a 260 uh, percent penetration. Everybody read more than one newspaper and more than one magazine a day. Now you only have about a 60% penetration of the internet and uh, mobile devices. So in a certain respect, you might say people have less news now than they did then, but they're, you know, they just continue to buy Time Magazine or uh, the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle. So there's a lot of things that, uh, as you say, kind of generational divides. But yeah, that, uh, those millennials are in there. Yes? I was thinking more back to the last slide of right after World War II. It's kind of amazing that all these things in that managed to get traction with the Russian. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of the the thing that needs to be celebrated with this. You had a lot going on that was very negative. But you had people that could innovate. They were creating a role for themselves and they were defining that role by what they were able to produce. So you had these huge outpourings of industry and in technology, arts, science, literature, and the acceptance of that amongst the survivors is what kept it going. Through the Depression, um, you did have a slowdown, of course, but once the, you had the foundation of, as I say, um, the creation of airlines, there was no civil air travel before World War I. So airlines had to be created, airports, you know, flight routes, all of that, navigation, everything, all of that had to be created. And today we just think of it as something second nature. We, it's not 
it's not a, anything that uh, that is exciting. Yeah, freeways, national freeways, things like that. There was not a national highway network. So the, the, when people said, oh, I'm going to travel, they might have traveled from you know, San Francisco to Los Angeles and thought, wow, that's you know, a huge undertaking. Nowadays, you can drive from Seattle to Key West and, uh, you know, with, with a well-marked map and, uh, and reliable highways. So there's, there's big changes, and people think of things differently because of those changes. Yes? There's, there's a lot of echo of masculinity and uh, femininity mm-hmm. that is underlying our current political chaos. I'm just curious why you call this masculinities, and where would the femininities be in your construct? The construct is what the historical construct was labeled as. So the masculinity of survival was a reference to the point that um, at that time, men were in charge of everything. And if you look at the prior years with the empires, men were in charge. The, the one slide did indicate that there was the women's suffrage and um, women's vote and other things that came after World War I. So the label for this masculinity of survival and things continued but the actual mix of who was involved in these things changed. So women started to have a much more prominent role. And, and as I mentioned, you know, Richmond had a woman mayor. You had the, you know, Rosie the Riveter, women that during World War II built the equipment and uh, the machinery for war. So there's, there is a label that's continued, but the mix of people within that grouping changed, so there is a much greater participation of women after World War I, and even greater today, although that label is still used. And I don't think, it's interesting because when I did the research, I couldn't find a, uh, anybody that disputed that label, the masculinity of survival. Um, and I think it may be just something that hasn't yet been addressed. Maybe for my next talk, I'll get it. Because I know I have, I'm aware, for instance, that a whole lot of the South survival were dependent on the strong women. Yes. The South. So I'm wondering where does that come into recognition in, in, in view of the world? It became recognized in other parts of the world before it became recognized in the US. And that's why I say, and at the end of the empires, you had um, in three quarters of the world's population were no longer under these rigid structures. So you actually had a, a prominent rise of women in other countries at a pace that was faster than the US. Um, so our references here are American, but if we went to India with an Indira Gandhi and uh, um, you know, other countries where they actually had women rising up into political uh, positions of power, that could then influence the social and uh, developmental course that the countries took. So yeah, that would, that's, that's something that uh, um, the U.S. lagged behind in it, and it's also a, a reflection of this American Protestant dream. That's one area that uh, um, it's still um, characterized by uh, the, the defined role for women, the defined role for men. Other questions? It seems um, there, there's kind of a, a tension between two ideas, I think, in, in the structure you have here. One is Mm-hmm. That uh, after World War One, with the loss of a lot of the more rigid structures, social structures, and the loss of the imperial structures that ruled a lot of those people, a lot of people around the world, that there was like a gap, mm-hmm. and, and new elites, intellectual elites, rose to fill that. But America was actually much less directly impacted. Right. By Relative few people mm-hmm. compared to 
that's correct. It is that that void that was created in Europe um, and amongst and, and the lack of uh, need to adhere to the rigid structures of empire worldwide was something that Americans were able to seize upon to export what they were developing. So people would see you know, skyscrapers as an example. They say we can get some of those. They'd hire American architects and engineers. Um, there are, you know, we just completed the uh, had just completed the National Railroad linkage, but in Europe that was far advanced already. They didn't need any of that. Um, airlines and things like that were developed here and then exported. And, and one thing that you can use as a guide on these things when you look at it. Uh, in countries other than the U.S., a lot of these major infrastructures and industries are nationalized because they're very expensive. Those countries didn't have the financial wherewithal to do this privately, so they, they created these national organizations that could be funded through taxpayer money and other uh, in order to get the technologies that um, were created here and, and exported. And that's uh, so when you, you, you know, in the, in, and it's something that comes up in the U.S. as an odd way that these things have to be managed. Um, you know, there's private airlines and there are uh, airports that are government owned, and the FAA is a, f a federal agency. And, and all of these things have to work together here. In other countries, it's actually easier because the, the government owns the airline, they own the airports, and they own the, the control systems. So that's, that's a little bit easier, and they'll have one administration to do it. So they could actually, in some, in some regards, accelerate a little bit better, which is why you're going to get better service on European airlines than you are on American airlines. And, but then if you look at that even further in, in detail, um, Airbus is a consortium of European nationalized airlines and European companies that rely on national contracts there, and they put together uh, new technologies and airlines, aircraft that are as good or better than the ones developed in the U.S. And that you can look at from other industries as well. You might say, though, that, uh, for example, innovation in social structures, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. They did. They did because they 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 had they, they there are certain things that they could um, look at the, from America and say that that's enviable and we want that, but their situation was dire. So the rise of um, the National Socialists or the rise of socialism. Um, the export of socialism uh, and the attempted exports for national socialism, the Nazis, uh, were things that they had that they thought that they could do. In the U.S. it was you know, different. It was a technology and uh, individual invention and reinvention. If you look at a lot of those practices and those uh, ideologies, they were actually bringing people back into the rigid structures that they were accustomed to before World War I. And even in the U.S., there was a lot of uh, debate and conflict over the rise of socialism or the nationalism in the U.S. and how that was all going to work out. So it uh, um, wasn't resolved. Well, actually, probably wasn't resolved until the you know this, the 70s. And uh, and those are those are those are things that. Um, we can look at it from the U.S. perspective and say, "Wow, that was a bit crazy over there." But from their perspective, they were, you know, coming out of a, a devastation, so they had to build themselves up, and uh, that was one way they could, which was through this collectivism. And then the rigid structures were put back in place, and it took a long time to undo those in Europe once they were there. No, no more questions. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. It was a pleasure, and I hope that you take the opportunity to walk through the museum and see the exhibits.
Oh, yes. Uh, we're in discussion now to put together um, a, a series of presentations or a, a day of presentations uh, that would cover the Richmond area or the called the Bay Area, uh, but focusing on Richmond um, from World War I through World War II. And there are some uh, photographic dis uh, permanent displays at the Oakland Museum that we're going to try to get. We have a couple of other photographers that can donate to that. The items from the museum here that we can either get photographed and displayed visually or can, can have those organized uh, for display. And there's a woman that's just written a book um, called Sons at War, which tracks the arc of one of her relatives that was killed in an aerial battle with a German uh, pilot. And then she went to Germany and traced his arc, his youth, up to that day. And uh, so you get a lot of perspective on these things. And their, their pilot was from, uh, was from Oakland, so we're going to give it a Bay Area focus. And that, we just started talking about it yesterday, but I think it'll advance quickly because uh, everybody involved was, has direct things that they can contribute. Yes? If we separate out the, the, the political world, which seems to have commanded 100% you know, of people's attention these days, and we look back beyond that at what we see going on in the communities, I think that there is a trend in, in, Amer in American cities now um, that's going to become a lot more inclusive and a lot more liberal. Um, and looking more at community as opposed to these, this uh, individual uh, invention and reinvention. So part of the reinvention will be I want to reinvent myself into somebody that can organize a community, can help in a community, participate in a community. So those are our are, are, uh, attributes and, and objectives that we can also trace back to the post-World War I era, probably even before, but it became prominent then. And uh, uh, the, the one, as I said, the one issue that seems to command all attention now is politics and that um, the institutions in America are very strong. So the, the political firestorm that you read about every day is actually contained um, within you know, the, the, the confines of Washington, D.C. Prim primarily. The area that I'm not quite familiar with um, that I will look into is more of what's happened in the Rust Belt communities, um, where at one time they were, they were the center of industry, they were prosperous and very proud, and now the industries have all moved out. So um, I'm not sure what the views are for the people that are living in those regions. Um, but there's, there's, there are efforts to rejuvenate those areas by bringing in these new industries and the the new industries would have to have accompanying them the people from the bigger cities that are going to bring those views and objectives. Um, I'd like to make a comment about the decline of the American It's, it's 
it, it will go in waves and it will go, you know, have its uh, periods when it's going to be more prevalent. But one of the major definitions for that is that people want to make progress by going to the past. And that creates a lot of friction. So in, as you see that there's a, a, an evolution in, and a, um, a revolution in technology and industry, there's what, and, and the lifestyles that uh, uh, people want to create around these new technologies and industries, what a lot of the people that adhere to this Protestant American dream, and which is now kind of embodied in the Tea Party, is that we can only progress if we adopt our practices from the past. And that's the behavioral social practices. Um, and that's been something that's always been there. It's, it's just at some points it has a quieter voice than other times. So now you're hearing a lot of it. And I say if you look beyond that, and a lot of it's because now it's politicized. It's in our political debate. And so you're hearing a lot more of it. Um, but if you look at the actual principles that guide the people that are talking about it the most, then it is this, we're going to go, uh, we're going to, the only way we can advance is to adapt pra practices from the past. And um, that's something that we don't know. You know I'm, I'm, my guess is that it's not going to work. It's not, it, it'll fade away again. But if you remember, even back to, uh, this, is, this has been building now for, for a period of time, all the way back to uh, the 1980 election. Um, and it's taking, you know, what's that, 37 years, and it's still you know, trying, to, trying to get a, a stronger foothold and get control. But it, 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 you know, I, I don't see that happening for any long period of time. There may be a short time when it's there. Yes? Start of World War One, ten percent of the population was German speaking. So yes, that's you know it was. This is confusing for everyone, um, and it was something that was very uh, much debated about. You know, and, and America didn't enter the war until America, America decided that they weren't going to enter the war until there was the Zimmerman telegram, which was written to the, ambas the German ambassador in Mexico to get him to create an alliance with Mexico to invade the U.S. And that's the, the tipping point right there. Prior to that, there were ships sunk and there was a lot of protests and things, um, but the U.S. was not involved other than providing materiel and arms uh, across the Atlantic. And do you think that happened? Yes, yes. You had the Bund Leagues in, the, in America, where every major city had a very large German population, and they had their own organizations. So yeah, and uh, there was a lot of uh, um, resistance to it, to America's entry into the war. Well, again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I appreciate.